Hello, and thank you for joining me for this talk. My name is Nick DePorzio, and I will be discussing how we can make better measurements of neutrinos and other light but massive relics using cosmological data sets. I collaborated on this work with Linda Zhu, Julian Munoz, and Cora Dvorkin, all at Harvard. And if you would like to follow a more detailed discussion of the results I present here, this talk corresponds to the two manuscripts on the archive listed at the bottom of this slide. So let me start by describing exactly what I mean when I say light but massive relics. Moving from right to left, relics just refers to thermal relics whose initial abundances were produced via thermal equilibrium with the standard model at early times. We are interested in thermal relics with a non-zero mass because this work is concerned with understanding how the transition of an initially relativistic thermal relic to a non-relativistic energy before today affects our cosmological observables. And so light simply refers to these thermal relics being sufficiently low in mass such that they are relativistic when they decouple from the standard model. Later in this talk and in the corresponding papers, light but massive relics may be referred to by their acronym LEMUR. A generic LEMUR under this description will be fully defined by three quantities, its mass, its temperature today, and its degrees of freedom. In this case, only the degrees of freedom thermalized with the standard model are important, so higher spin particles will have two degrees of freedom. A familiar example of a lemur is the neutrino, which we know decoupled from the standard model relativistically. From oscillation experiments, we know two of the neutrino mass splittings, but we only know the sign of the splitting for one. This leaves two possible neutrino mass hierarchies, the normal hierarchy and the inverted hierarchy. In the minimal mass scenario, where the lightest neutrino is massless, the remaining two neutrinos will have masses in excess of their temperature today, and so will be non-relativistic. This is true for both hierarchies, so we know at least two of the three neutrinos are non-relativistic today. By definition, our relics are relativistic when they decouple. As such, a generic lemur will behave as dark radiation in the early universe. If the lemur is relativistic at recombination, this will manifest as a change in the amplitude and phase of the acoustic peaks of the CMB tail and will produce a shift in the effective number of radiation degrees of freedom and effective. Similarly, if the relic is relativistic during Big Bang nucleosynthesis, extra radiation degrees of freedom will modify the helium abundance and also manifest a shift in an effective. If a light relic was still relativistic today, its entire effect on the cosmology would be contained in a shift to an effective. Since a generic lemur will be relativistic at early times, then we can generally expect that some of its overall effect on cosmology will manifest as a shift in an effective. We can write this shift with respect to the known contribution to an effective due to neutrinos. In this case, the shift would only depend on the relic's temperature and degrees of freedom, in addition to its bosonic or fermionic nature, which is accounted for in the prefactor of C1 at the bottom equation. Considering the cases of Weyl fermions, Dirac fermions, scalar bosons, and vector bosons, we can infer how an effective should respond as a function of either the relic temperature today, or equivalently, the standard model temperature when the relic decoupled. Here's what that would look like for the case of a 20 MeV light relic with temperature of 0.91 Kelvin for various choices of degrees of freedom. Now, we also expect lemurs to have an effect on the matter power spectrum. Lemurs begin relativistic, so at small scales, light relics will have large thermal motions and will freely stream out of matter potential wells. So there will be a smaller fraction of matter available to cluster at small scales. Additionally, because light relic fluctuations will be suppressed at small scales, the growth of cold dark matter and baryon overdensities will be further slowed. At late times, we expect cold dark matter and baryons to largely follow each other. So we can express the total matter fluctuations at late times as a sum of the cold dark matter plus baryon fluctuations and a contribution from each lemur where the contribution of each species is weighted by its fractional abundance. Here I've explicitly written out the sum over neutrinos as they're just a, a special case of lemur. Since lemurs are not massless, an initially relativistic light relic will eventually become non-relativistic. This will result in a suppression to the matter power spectrum and matter fluctuations below some characteristic free streaming scale. We're familiar with such free streaming scales in the case of neutrinos, 
Using the same logic that we use for neutrinos, we can express the free streaming scale for a generic relic in terms of the neutrino free streaming scale. Using a modified version of class, these changes are modeled in detail to find the full effect on cosmological observables, which appears as a step-like suppression to the matter power spectrum, which sets in at the free streaming scale and has an amplitude proportional to the lemur abundance. Generally, the earlier a lemur becomes non-relativistic, the greater the suppression to the matter power spectrum. With that said, we should expect a cosmology with massive neutrinos to exhibit a suppression in the matter power spectrum that a massless cosmology would not. We can see here that this is the case. Further, assuming the same total neutrino mass, we see that there are slightly different effects on the matter power spectrum for the different neutrino mass hierarchies. So this is information that we can utilize in addition to changes in an effective to learn about neutrinos and lemurs more generally. Our options for observing these changes to the matter power spectrum include using the weak lensing information of the CMB or indirectly inferring them through galaxy observations. In this case, where we want to study the underlying matter power spectrum by observing the galaxy power spectrum, there's an additional step we have to take. We conventionally relate these two quantities through the bias function. In other words, how likely is a galaxy to form in the presence of a background matter overdensity of some particular amplitude. In the simplest case, we can relate halo overdensities to matter overdensities to first order like so. Note that the alpha k squared term is included to account for known nonlinearities in the bias, but it does not relate to the inclusion of lemurs in our cosmology, and later in the results we marginalize over it accordingly. Previous to this work, constraints made on lemurs, including neutrinos, typically assumed that the Eulerian bias, B1, had no scale dependence. However, the inclusion of light relics in our cosmology modifies the spherical collapse process and has been found to introduce a scale dependence into the bias. This change to the bias was termed the growth-induced scale-dependent bias. Here, to find the effect of this growth-induced scale-dependent bias on neutrino constraints, the nonlinear, nonlocal, and temporal spherical collapse process is modeled using the previously developed relic fast code as a submodule of class. This work is discussed in detail in work by Munoz and Dvorkin. Um, we call this modified version of class Relic Class, and it is publicly available at these sites. We can use Relic Class to provide the full shape information of the growth-induced scale-dependent bias, and that shape is plotted here for a degenerate neutrino hierarchy with a total neutrino mass of 90 MeV. The lightest color line here corresponds to a redshift of 0.65, and progresses to redshift 1.95 at the darkest line. As an alternative to the full shape information, we can parameterize this effect, which appears as a step at some scale with a redshift dependent amplitude. In the results I will present for generic lemurs, we do precisely that. For each lemur, including neutrinos, we add a multiplicative term to the bias that characterizes where the growth induced scale dependent bias turns on for that relic. We add one additional term to account for the change in growth rate before and after matter radiation equality in a lambda CDM cosmology. At large scales, the growth induced scale dependent bias and the alpha k squared terms become negligible, and we choose a description for the redshift dependence of the bias that matches the parameter parameterization used in the science book for the experiment and tracer, tracer we are using in our analysis. Here we can see that in the case of neutrinos with a total mass of 100 MeV, there's an order half a percent shift in the galaxy power spectrum due to this growth induced scale dependent bias. In this plot, uh, the shaded region represents the shot noise of each experiment. Uh, and this shift will partially compensate for the suppression to the matter power spectrum discussed earlier. To complete our bias description, we still need to finish our expression for the redshift dependence of the bias. To do this, we will adopt the form used in the science book for each experiment and tracer we use in our analyses. On the LSS side, uh, we will use the luminous red galaxy sample from SDSS BOSS, the emission line galaxy sample from DESI, and the hydrogen alpha sample from Euclid. The corresponding bias prescriptions from the respective science books are presented here. On the DESI side, DZ is the growth factor and is provided by class. In both cases, both beta zero and beta one are nuisance parameters which describe an overall rescaling and redshift dependence, respectively, and which are free, which we're free to marginalize over. In conducting our analysis, we found that lack 
of redshift dependence in the DESI bias prescription is important, and I'll explain why when I present the results. However, we also expect that these simple bias prescriptions for DESI and Euclid will adopt a more sophisticated form after data is collected and analyses on the actual data is presented. With a full parameterization of the changes to an effective, the matter power spectrum and the galaxy bias in hand, we are now set to ask the question, how well can we measure neutrinos and other lemurs using cosmological data sets? To place constraints on cosmological parameters, we can either carry out a full MCMC or capture almost the same information to first order using a Fisher forecast. We will use an MCMC to produce results for neutrinos. And in the case of generic lemurs, where there is much more parameter space to explore, we will use a Fisher forecast. We will consider various combinations of CMB and large-scale structure experiments to do this. On the galaxy side, we use the following target galaxy densities and sky coverage as obtained from the respective science books. On the CMB side, we will only model our surveys as having a single observing frequency and will include the following modes and data sets. Additionally, we restrict the modes for the CMB S4 temperature autocorrelation to avoid foreground contamination and include a 0.01 Gaussian prior on tau in lieu of the small L modes. Recall from earlier that the parameters that define a lemur are its mass, temperature, and thermalized degrees of freedom. In order to study this parameter space efficiently, we first need to limit it to a region of interest. Our degrees of freedom are already limited. Since only degrees of freedom that thermalize with the standard model will modify our cosmology, we only care about valfermions with two thermalized degrees of freedom, Dirac fermions with four, scalars with one, and vectors with two thermalized degrees of freedom. Conservation of co-moving entropy will allow us to calculate what the temperature of, of a species is today as a function of when it decoupled from the standard model. For minimal extension to the standard model, the lowest temperature we can yield for a relic today is 0.91 Kelvin. We can then use the Planck constraint on N effective to inform us as to the hottest temperature a Valfermion can have today, such that it satisfies that bound. The temperature is 1.5 Kelvin. As for the mass, if we want our relic to be non-relativistic today, then its mass must exceed its temperature, giving us a lower bound of 10 MeV. Finally, we know that the contribution of a relic to cold dark matter should not exceed the known abundance of cold dark matter in the universe. It is still conservative to assume the relic does not compose more than 10% of the cold dark matter, though we can always relax this assumption if we wish. In any case, for a Valfermion with the lowest possible temperature, this provides an upper bound of 10 EV on the mass. We can also greatly simplify this analysis by taking advantage of previous work showing that any type of fermionic or bosonic relic can be recast as an effective valve relic with an equivalent effect on the cosmology under the following reparameterization. This way, we can write a single analysis for valve fermions and generate results for other relic distribution functions by simply shifting the mass and temperature in our valve fermion analysis. All right, so first, for the case of neutrinos, we run an MCMC using mock data for CMBS4 and Euclid. Uh, we consider the inverted hierarchy as the fiducial cosmology and find an error in the sum of neutrino masses of 20 MeV. While this constitutes a five sigma detection from zero, it is a two sigma detection from the normal hierarchy at 60 MeV. Here is plotted the marginalized posteriors after including the growth induced scale dependent bias effect in our analysis, marginalizing over both beta zero and beta one nuisance parameters and including a Gaussian prior on tau with a width of 0.01. We also make conclusions on the influence of the growth-induced scale-dependent bias effect on searches for neutrinos. Growth-induced scale-dependent bias introduces a scale-dependent suppression and an enhancement to the redshift dependence of bias induced by neutrinos. However, the scales at which the scale-dependent suppression occurs are typically cosmic variance limited, and so the redshift dependence enhancement dominates the growth-induced scale-dependent uh, bias effect. So, omitting growth-induced scale-dependent bias from our analysis tended to overpredict the sum of neutrino masses. Recall that the bias prescription for DESI had no nuisance parameter to account for the redshift dependence of the bias. As a result, neglecting growth-induced scale-dependent bias introduced a one-sigma overestimation of the sum of neutrino masses and a sub-sigma shift to other parameters. On the left 
is plotted the marginalized posteriors for a degenerate hierarchy using CMBS4 plus DESI, where we exclude growth-induced scale-dependent bias in the red contours. We recover similar behavior for CMBS4 plus Euclid, where we fix the beta-1 nuisance parameter, which carries the redshift dependence of the bias. So, in any parameterization of the bias that does not include a term that accounts for the redshift dependence, the growth-induced scale-dependent bias should be included to avoid biased estimates of the cosmological parameters. And to recap, uh, if we hope to distinguish the neutrino hierarchy using only cosmological data, more advanced experiments will be necessary. We move on to perform our analysis over the parameter space of generic light but massive relics that we identified earlier, which as a reminder was 0.91 to 1.5 Kelvin and 10 MeV to 10 EV. In this analysis, we performed a Fisher forecast in which we fixed combinations of mass and temperature and varied the relic degrees of freedom in addition to the standard cosmological parameters and the sum of neutrino masses. In general, we found that the next generation of surveys is capable of observing or ruling out lemurs at a three sigma significance for all masses above order one EV. Even the presently available BOSS and Planck datasets were able to jointly constrain relics at this significance above a few EV for all but scalar bosons. Here in the left plot, we show the result of our forecast for a valve fermion at the minimum allowed temperature using Planck only data, DESI only data, and the combined data set. Where the lines drop below three sigma, we are able to constrain the relics, the relics in that parameter space to at least three sigma significance. In the right-hand plot, we only consider the combined data set, but we show how the constraint changes as we consider different values of the relic temperature. In this plot, all values to the right of the three similar line are constrained. As expected, we can constrain to lower masses the hotter our relic is. Here I show the same plot as in the last slide, but I also show results for the other allowable relic degrees of freedom and for additional data combinations. In general, we have greater constraining power for relics with higher degrees of freedom. In the case of a Dirac fermion, at minimum temperature, which is the hardest temperature to constrain, we see that using CMBS4 data combined with either DESI or Euclid is able to rule out the entire parameter space of the relic. All of these demonstrate that at least part of the parameter space can be ruled out for every type of lemur by the upcoming generation of surveys, and this should serve as motivation to perform this analysis on actual data. The result for Dirac fermions being particularly exciting. Our final result concerning lemurs concerns the effect that having the sum of neutrino masses as a parameter in our model affects our results, and vice versa. In general, we find that if the sum of neutrino masses can be learned independent from cosmology, say by particle experiments, then it will improve the constraints on lemurs by roughly 20%. By contrast, the presence of a lemur in the cosmology has a significant effect on how well the sum of neutrino masses is constrained. Here, we show how the constraint on neutrino masses is affected by the presence of a lemur with temperature 0.91 Kelvin and over various masses. The degradation that results is as little as about 10% for heavy relics and futuristic datasets to over 60% for lower masses and current datasets. In conclusion, we've learned that there is much information to be gained about light but massive relics, including neutrinos, through the modeling of both their relativistic and non-relativistic effects on the CMB and galaxy observables. In addition to the shift in an effective that lemurs introduced due to their relativistic behavior, we know that lemurs introduce a suppression to the matter power spectrum at some characteristic scale, and that suppression is partially compensated by a modification to the halo bias in galaxy surveys. This effect on the bias, the growth-induced scale-dependent bias, will tend to introduce deviations in cosmological parameters if unaccounted for. And finally, by using the information gained by modeling these three effects, we can constrain significant portions of the interesting parameter space available to lemurs. And in the special case of Dirac fermions, the next generation of surveys should be able to constrain the entire parameter space. Thus, this study should have demonstrated that this is an interesting analysis to perform, that it can be improved, for example, by using a multi-tracer analysis or by independent measurements of uh, by particle experiments, and that in any case, it should be carried out on actual data. With that in mind, thank you for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions you have.